Father, we just thank you and praise you for this day. And I thank you that the Word of God is uh, alive and sharp and actually changes our life. And today, uh, there's a hunger and thirst inside of us. And you said if we'd hunger and thirst, we'd be satisfied. So we're asking for that and receiving that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've got the sheet there. You can look at those scriptures after and during if you want to. Uh, from the Passion Bible, and then go back to your Bible and look at them. Uh, there's the whole Romans 7. Actually, I'm sorry, but the last few verses of Romans 7 uh, isn't on there. I actually didn't click enough, and I didn't notice it until I had it all printed. But, um, but anyway, let's begin on this. You, you are a winner. I remember a guy sharing in church once that he was, a prof he was a wrestler and very good in high school and college. And he ended up um, wrestling this great big kid, and he could have pinned him in the first few seconds. But in his heart, he just didn't pin him. But he would get him in places, and, and would, he was just, wasn't playing with him, but he's wrestling with him. And he just felt like this big kid just needed encouragement. So he said, he said, I would get him down. I'd get my ear right, my mouth right next to his ear. And then he said, you are a winner. And he would whisper that to him, why he was wrestling. You are a winner. Now, this guy that was uh, able to pin him real fast, he had an incredible reputation. So it wasn't like... It wasn't like uh, just anybody saying you're a winner. It was somebody who was extremely successful, extremely good, kept telling this young big boy that sometimes you just think because people are big, they got confidence, but that's not true. <laughs> oh, so if I was that big, I'd be, I wouldn't be afraid. You know, I had some friends that were so big and so strong in high school, and I thought, man, if I was in a dark alley with them, I'd feel comfortable. And I mentioned to them once, and they said, I'd be scared out of my mind. <laughs> they said, I'm the biggest. <laughs> in fact, you know, they're real scaredy cats, some of them. Anyway, I always remembered that of just this man. He finally did pin him, but he just finally said, and he got up and shook his hand. He said, you are a winner. That young man began to change his life from that moment. He began to believe it. He began because somebody that he respected, that he knew was very good, named him, called him a winner, and it began to change his life. And he went on to be not just successful in wrestling, but successful in life. Here's the reality that uh, Hitler and Stalin and all those people lived by. It was if you tell a lie long enough, everybody will believe it. If you tell a lie long enough, everybody will believe it. It's the scariest thing. I had a friend in high school in seventh grade that uh, we had a teacher that was went crazy, and in a few years we might have helped. But uh, anyway, there's some great stories that came out of that. And but he embellished some of the stories, and uh, finally, in our latter high school years, he was telling, and I said, you know, I said that wasn't quite how it happened. You all said, yes, it was. And he told the story so long wrong that he actually ended up believing in himself. That's a very possible thing. You hear a lie long enough, you will believe it. And a lot of people are hearing that they're losers. A lot of people are hearing in their own mind, in their own, that they're not going to make it, that evil's going to come, that the tragedy's going to happen, that there's nothing good coming, and you can believe it. But here's a really interesting thought. You hear, what happens if you hear the truth over and over? That's just the power of a lie that isn't even truth. What if you hear the truth over and over? And the Bible literally says that's the way faith comes, by hearing over and over the truth of the gospel. And it comes to a point where you actually do believe it. And when you do believe it, the Bible says this, if you believe that you have received it, it will be granted to you. So things literally manifest in our life. We can actually see into the unseen things that aren't there and actually create a manifestation of God's goodness in our life because we just keep hearing the truth over and over and over and over. So I want to encourage you in this day and age because we are bombarded with lies. And the only one that's going to bombard us with truth is ourselves. We have to have a plan to do that. You know, uh, I, too, went up in the hills yesterday. We'd left Dakota at a restaurant, so I thought at least I'd go up in Deadwood and get it. 
but then as I got up there, I ended up just driving up past Savoy, and I had gone camping up there when I was in high school, and I and I couldn't even find the place. I thought, man, I I got all lost up here, but I think I eventually found it. It's uh, like seven to ten late little ponds. That are, it's the head of the spearfish waters that feed the spearfish creek. And I was stunned to see that it looked abandoned. Nobody was there. It's a, one of the most beautiful pieces of property in the Black Hills. I think I might have to check it out, see if it's for sale. <laughs> might have to put a camp there or something. But um, but it was beautiful and is to, to be up in the trees and and to see all the all the all the good things. And sometimes it just does your soul good to, uh, as Jody was saying, just to worship God in the sanctuary of this earth and remember that it's it's not all bad. There's a lot of good. Let me go back. You are a winner. And let's go back clear to the beginning. You and I, the, one of the things we're understanding more and more is the connections are eternal. There's, there's just, there's friendships you have that you haven't seen for a long time, but I won't try to get into it all, but in studying quantum physics and all that, we find out that Things that are connected connect. It's just the most mysterious thing, but it's connected forever. And uh, whether we recognize it or not, we're connected. You know, you take twins that are separated at birth, and and they don't even know each other. They never even knew each other exists. And when they meet each other 50 years later, they married almost the same guys. They wear the same hairstyle. They change the hairstyle at the same time. It's just weird how connected we are. And so, in the very beginning, we were connected with Adam because we're part of the family of mankind. We're in that family. And our DNA came from him. And, we, and so, the Bible talks about, uh, you know, being in the bosom of somebody before you're born. Okay? My kids were inside me before they were born. And, and uh, so, we were inside Adam before now. I mean, so, we were there. In the beginning. And in the beginning, we were good. God created everything and created Adam and Eve, and he said, it is good. We were good. We, the family of mankind, was created good in relationship and fellowship with their father, the creator of the universe. We were good. You know, that may sound simple to you, but for years I always just said, man, we were born bad because of what I ministered on about the flesh. We were born bad. I mean, we were born in wrath. We were born, but that's talking about, that's actually after the fall. After the fall, our nature, Jesus said, uh, God said, you eat of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, of experiencing good and evil, and judging good and evil, you're going to die. And so you and I died way back at the beginning. But we were good before that. We were winners. Hallelujah. So we've been talking about, um, instead of saying, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Saying, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? And this is just to help us get our focus. I hope you've been doing it. I know I have, uh, uh, because one of my favorite things to say in the morning is, God, what do I do today? No, I threw out the day. What do you want me to do? In the moment I'm saying that now, I'm hoping that's happening for you. The moment I think that, say that, I, I flip it to, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? What a wonderful thing to think about the Holy Spirit is active and well and, and, and thriving and is, 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 all, all, is all over the world and with everybody. And, and what is he doing? And, you know, I love, I, it's so I don't know how to have an image of the Holy Spirit because uh, like Jesus got into a body, we don't know that with the Holy Spirit, but, but just one thing about him, he's just a winner. He's never going to lose. He never gives up. He always has a way of answer. He's always the most powerful. What is he doing in the earth today? And when I think, just think about that, I hope you're thinking about that. When you think about it, you can think about how everything is going bad and how many evil people there are and all that kind of stuff. But when you say, Holy Spirit, what are you doing? The picture just changes because he's not going to be defeated. 
He's not giving up. He's not discouraged. He's not wringing his hands saying, oh my, oh my. And then you think, and he's not sitting around being lazy. He was sent by Jesus and by the Father to be with each one of us to cause us to be successful. He's the down payment or the assurance of every good thing that God has for us throughout the ages. That's a, and he's on quest. He's, he's like, uh, he's a good, I mean, you know, it's not like when dad said, son, go do that. And we go, oh, I don't want to. You know, I'm probably better. I mean, no, the Holy Spirit is not that way at all. When the Father said, go and be with each one of them, guide them, teach them, bring it to remembrance, show them the truth, uh, show them things to come, he's on go. Man, he is thrilled to be doing that with us. He he doesn't go to the Father and say, boy, these people are driving me crazy. They're just so doubtful and disbelieving. No, he doesn't say that. No, he, he is right beside you. It says no matter where you go, whatever you do, he's there for your success. He's waiting for you uh, to acknowledge him and let him, and him do his work. And so we were born winners. We actually had a death come in when Adam died. Okay, and, he's, and then the Holy Spirit, by Jesus' crucifixion, we were actually restored back to being good. What is happening right now in the world is historically uh, going to be recorded forever as one of the wildest times and the most, uh, one of the greatest uproars of evil. And what should we do? What should we do? The Bible says he who resists the evil one, when he's taken out, then it'll be, you know, we, we're, the Holy Spirit Inside the body of Christ is what resists the evil. The Bible says you resist the devil. So the only people that can resist this evil flow that's happening in the world today is us, filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're not taken out yet, so we still got this thing to do to resist. Change is not going to stop. Okay, we're into a a season where it's not just being added, it's multiplied. The Lord gave me a word back way back in 1990 about the, this thing is going to go exponentially now. It's going to start multiplying. That's just, if you do anything with finances, you know that's a crazy thing when you start. You don't just add, you start multiplying. And so right now, uh, if you've got the dream of, oh, I can't wait till it gets back to normal, there's, there's no back to normal that's ever going to come. We've been changing so rapidly in the last 50 years, and it's, it's increasing. It's not going to slow down. So in some ways, I want to just kind of encourage you, give up the fantasy of saying, I hope it goes back to normal. It's not. At the same time, get excited and hopeful because the change can be wonderful. There are some things that are changing that are going to be better than it's ever been before on the earth today. Better than it's ever been before. And we've got to live in one of the most uh, awesome times of being blessed of all societies. I mean, you know, with these people that say, you know, America's bad and everything's bad, I mean, they've never traveled. They've never studied history. (laughs) They don't go anyplace. So you can't call our lifetime here bad if you've been anyplace else or you studied anything about history. Solomon, with all his gold and glory, didn't have an air conditioner. I mean, he didn't have a, a cushioned seat to sit on in his chariot or much. I mean, they, we are more blessed than Solomon. You know, I mean, what can you do with cities of gold back then? I mean, with, we're blessed, okay, and it's going to get better. The kingdom of God, Jesus said in Isaiah, it was prophesied that it would, once it started, it would not decrease, it would only increase. So as evil is increasing, so is the grace of God, so is the incredible things of God, and things are not going to uh, be the same. So, uh, you know, in some ways, just be wise and sensible. Don't waste all your energy dreaming about the past. It's like the children of Israel that we talked about, you know, when they... When God brought them out, it was to take them in, but instead of going in, they sat there and began to think, oh, Egypt wasn't all that bad. Wish we could go back. And as good as our life has been, don't wish that you could go back. We're moving on. 
lift up our eyes and rise up and get excited about the changes that are happening because the Holy Spirit is not slacking. He is not losing. He is fulfilling the will of the Father, which is to fill the whole earth with His glory. Yes, there's a lot of other things that will take place, but that's why we believe God for safety for everybody that is in the kingdom right now. We need to be praying for people that are in these areas with riots, that they're supernaturally protected. That we walk supernaturally with the shield of faith around us. And no evil befalls us. All these things are ours to have, but they have to be acknowledged and they have to be asked for. So keep your prayer life going for all people. Glory to God. What is the Holy Spirit doing? In Hebrews, <clears throat> the ninth chapter, verse 26, you have it on your sheet if you want to look at it in the Passion. It says, for that would mean, he, it's talking about the high priest not having to go in all the time, that when Jesus was sacrificed, he didn't have to go back and be sacrificed. Let me just read it. For that would mean he, would, he must suffer repeatedly ever since the fall of the world. But now he has appeared at the fulfillment or the consummation of the ages to abolish sin once and for all by the sacrifice of himself. What is the Holy Spirit doing? He's fulfilling the plan of God for this age to finish or complete, bring the entire completion of abolishing sin through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what's going on right now. Evil's not increasing. It's on its way out. You know, I won't read them, but there's scriptures in uh, Matthew 13, uh, 40, 49, it says, in the, last, in the last of the age, you know, I, I know everybody thinks we're going to be jerked out of here, and maybe, but there's a lot of scriptures say the evil will be gathered up and pulled away from the righteous. The evil ones will be gathered up and removed from the righteous. There's more scriptures talk about that than us being pulled out of here. You can figure out, if you can figure out all that, it's fine. But I'm just saying, the Holy Spirit's job right now, he is fulfilling the work of Christ of abolishing sin once and for all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's what's going on. In Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 10, and because of God's unfailing purpose, is God's purpose going to fail? No. His unfailing purpose this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of all the ages finally reaches its climax when God makes all things new in all of heaven and on earth through Jesus Christ. We're in that process right now. We're in that process, this unfailing purpose of God, and this detailed plan that he would bring all things into Christ Jesus. Pulls it all together in him. That's what's going on right now. That's where you and I can get excited about. That's where you and I can line up with him and do our part. You know, I was just thinking about a great coach. And a great coach, in my opinion, takes the players that come in. He doesn't take them and put them into his program. To me, that's not a great coach. And there's a lot of people that coach that way. They have a preconceived plan of idea how they're going to do it, what, t what plays they're going to run, and so they run those plays. But to me, the higher level of coaching is when the players come in and the coach gets to know them. And he observes them. And he watches them. And he lets them play out. And then he has a great coach. He has the wisdom to understand what's intrinsically in each player where their giftings are, where their talents are, what could be developed there. And instead of working on all their weaknesses, he starts working on their strengths and helping them control their weaknesses. A great coach looks at every individual player there and becomes the guide to that child or that player to become their very best. Then the next step that he does is he puts together now after he understands and perceives what's in each player, he then works to develop that in them, but then he also puts a plan to put, each, to put all of them together 
on the field for success. I don't know if it means anything to you, but for me, I've watched sports all my life, and it's just like, my gosh, if anybody, you know, uh, the Phoenix Suns once were losing, and they brought this lady in, and she understood this very concept I'm teaching about and flipped that whole team around, but they had to fire half the coaching staff because they would not flip their thinking of saying, those players will do what I tell them to do. They had to flip their thinking of those players, I'll find out what they do best and I'll put them, in, I'll put them where they can do that. And then we'll put them together as a team. Our God right now is working with each one of us individually. See, a lot of people just want to join, uh, you know, an organization, join a group or whatever, and just say, hey, we're part of that. Hey, we can, yeah, we're part of that. And yet not really be, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, they didn't want to be a Michael Jordan because they'd rather just be on the bench and, and have the, the ring you know, at the end, you know. And, you know, and, uh, but they, they didn't want to put out what Michael Jordan put out. They wanted, didn't want to work as hard as he wanted to work. So some people are just happy to be on the team and not really be, you know, all that dedicated, whatever else. It's just our team. You know, I think about guys, I'm sorry if I'm making fun of anybody. But, you know, there's people that wear the, the, their team shirts and they get all excited, you know. And, and uh, it's like, go! I won't mention any names because um, you might like that team. But go team, go team! You know, it's like, and I go, who are you? You're nothing but a bystander that put on a jersey and said, that's my team, but you're nothing. You're not a contributor, except for your shouting. And I don't know if that impresses you or not, but I don't mind shouting for a team, but dear God, I don't want to be just a bystander in life shouting for somebody else's deal. I want to be involved. I want to be player. I don't have to be the best, but I want to be on there. And if I'm not even noted, and when, you know, and I wasn't a great player. But at the same time, even in basketball, I only played a couple years and I quit. But when, even then, I, I did what I just said. I looked and I found the strengths of my teammates. And I worked plays to get the ball to them, hallelujah. And then in soccer, I just ran my guts off to, just so that I could be out there distracting everybody so the good players could play. I'm just saying, I still want to be involved, and I worked hard at it. Amen. Why wouldn't we want to do that with the family of God? Why wouldn't we want to do that by building the kingdom of God? This is not a thing just that we sit back and observe all the, uh, you know, and frankly, I'm sorry, but there's some, there's some ministries that a lot of people go to that they're not connected really at all. They show up when they want to. They leave when they want to. Then they go, that's my church, you know, and, and if, dear God, don't, you know, some people say, uh, what do they say? I love my church. And it's like, that's like, I love my team. And I go, you don't ever need to say, I love my church. Why? Because we actually love each other. It should be evident. And it is evident. But we're players. And our coach is not just helping us, you know, win so that all the rest of us sitting on the bench get to, you know, have, have a ring and have a, a, a banner or something, a ribbon. No, our coach wants, he's individually working with each one of us because he's putting certain gifts and qualities inside of us and we're crucial to the team and he knows that. And he's pulling out of each one of us. And it, it, me, there's, listen, there's just not that many people that want to do that, to be real honest. They'd rather be on the bench or up in the grandstands yelling, that's my team, than they would actually be involved in the training and the, the commitment and all that it takes to be you, all that it takes to be you and be you the best you can be, glory to God. And make no mistake, God did not make a mistake by making you. And you're not the second class in any shape or form. That just, that's just totally unscriptural, totally unwrong. God is, is working with each one of us, hallelujah. He's pulling it all together. And right now there's some things coming together more than ever before. Let's look at one more scripture. <clears throat> uh, Romans 13, 9 says, For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and every other commandment can be summed up in these words. 
love and value others in the same way that you love and value yourself. Listen, people are trying to find all the rules and all that, and the law was good, and we all know that. We'll read a little bit more about that. But, we, you know, here's the deal. You don't really need to know the Ten Commandments. They're really kind of, the Bible actually said they're kind of useless for us. See, what are you talking about, Pastor? I said, listen, you don't need to know the Ten Commandments. You don't need to memorize them. They don't need to be taught in our schools. They don't need to be everywhere. That was the law. And it was good. It was meant for our good. But the truth is, Jesus came to put the laws in our heart. Not just on tablets. And not just on printed page. And when you actually get connected and get born again and get connected and are a child of God and walking in the Spirit, you really don't need all those laws because they don't, you'll never break them. You don't need to know the list because you'll never break them. Without even knowing them, you'll never break them. Why? Because the ultimate law is love one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Value them as you value yourself. And when, you, when you're walking in that truth, there's, there's no need to know any of those other laws. You're naturally doing them. And so one of the things we got to do is start valuing ourselves. We're critical. Our part is critical. Nobody is on the bench. Nobody. Nobody's waiting to be put in the game. We're all in the game. And like Michael Jordan, we need to work our tails off to be the, our very best of who we are, of who we are. You can't do that if you're trying to be like somebody else. You can't do that if you're listening. Listen, you don't need to listen to the coach coaching the other player. You need to listen to the coach coaching you. Just you. Value that. Love one another. As simple as that may seem, that you and I focus down on that. Put our energies down on that. Throw out a whole lot of the other stuff that's bombarding us. Stop worrying about all the things going on in the world. Stop worrying about all that crap going on and just say, Coach, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to work on today? And he's going to say, I want you to work on love, value yourself, and then value your neighbor and love. And we'll defeat. We'll defeat. The darkness that is the will of God that sin will be destroyed. And people will be set free. Joel 2, 28 through 29 says this. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus and I thank you. We acknowledge that we are in the last days and the spirit of God is being poured out on all flesh, including us. And I thank you that you're giving us dreams and visions. We're, we're walking in the supernatural. You're filling our hearts and our minds up with your truth, with your, your plans and your purposes. And so, Father, we thank you that we can renew our minds, send away all the confusion, send away all the, the yelling and screaming and all the noise that's in the earth today. Father, I thank you that you're helping us discard that, push it aside, and keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, and as a coach, you're coaching us so that we have total success. Hallelujah. And bringing the light of the gospel to every nation. Hallelujah. How much different is that than everybody saying, oh my gosh, we got to pray. Everything's going down the tube. Did you just read about that? Look at what they're doing. Man, listen, that's just, frankly, that's a waste of time. We get focused on valuing ourselves. And for a lot of you, this is something that you're, you're going to have to work on to really value your own life. It's not based on you and I sacrificing everything. It's you and I taking the sacrifice of Jesus and obtaining righteousness, obtaining the blessings of the Lord, and obtaining his spirit of love for our neighbor. Well, then we gotta, I'll just go to this uh, Romans 7. What an incredible scripture. You can read the first part about that. I, there's so much I'd like to teach on that, but I'll, I'll close with this. 
I'm going to pick up this. Uh, by the way, when I printed this, it didn't put out the verses. So on the second page, or the second half of the page, if you got that sheet and you want to follow along, I'm going to start with about the third sentence. And it says, I once lived without clear understanding of the law, but when I heard God's commandments, sin sprung up to life and brought with it a death sentence. The commandment that was intended to bring life brought me death instead. Sin, by means of the commandment, built a base of operation within me to overpower me and put me to death. We were good. Then death came to us. By sin, if I want you to just get a picture of this sin... Is not just a sin you commit, but the personality or person of sin that wants us, that's trying to kill us. Sin, by means of the commandment, built a base of operation within me to overpower me and put me to death. So then we have to conclude that the problem is not with the law itself, for the law was holy and its commandments are correct and for our good. Law under the law, so did something meant to be good became death to me? No, the law was good, but the sin took advantage of it. It takes a little time to think through all that, but keep going. said, certainly not. It was not the law, but sin unmasked that produced my spiritual death. The sacred commandment merely uncovered the evil of sin so it could be seen for what it was, for what it is. For we know that the law is divinely inspired and comes from the spiritual realm, but I am a human being, a human being made of flesh and trafficked, trafficked, as a slave under sin's authority. In the Greek, it means you were sold for, you were sold for exportation and betrayed and ruined. You and I, who were born good in God at the time of Adam, created by God, were good. And then, because of this flesh and its fallen nature, we were trafficked in. We were bought up. We were sold as slaves for our destruction. Hallelujah. See, if you can start separating who you are as a winner, of God, as a God's child, and separate yourself from that and see what sin has done to you, how it's enslaved you, how it's taken over you, how it's taking you down to ruin your life will radically change understanding of this will set you free you'll start valuing your life you and i will you know all, all of us we're in that point we've come a long ways but we got a long ways to go we can grow in this understanding how valuable we are now and then how valuable everybody else is and separate this thing out for what it is i i'm a mystery to myself. And when Paul is writing here, uh, a lot of theologians, a lot of, and the Greek actually indicates he's not just telling his testimony, he's saying, I as far as mankind. He's talking about all of us. All of us were, uh, were what he's referring to, he's referring to all of us as mankind. So he goes on, I'm a mystery to myself, for I want to do what is right, but end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. And if my behavior is not in line with my desire, my conscience still confirms the excellence of the law. And now I realize that it is no longer my true self doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. Unwelcome intruder. You and I were created good in God, and then an unwelcome intruder came in, bringing death to us. It was sin. For I know that nothing good lives within, my, within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right is within me, but willpower is not enough to accomplish it. My lawfully desires to do what is good are dashed when I do the things I want to avoid. 
So if my behavior contradicts my desires to do good, I must conclude that it's not my true identity doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin hindering me from being who I really am. Through my experience of this principle, I discovered that even when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. Truly deep within my true identity, I love to do what is pleasing to God. But I discern another power operating in my humanity, waging a war against the moral principles of my conscience and bringing me to captivity as a prisoner of the law of sin. This unwelcome intruder in my humanity, what an agonizing situation I'm in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of the sin and death? And unfortunately, I didn't print the last verses. Paul is not just talking about his life. He's talking about all of us. We're born in the image of God, created on that first day, and we were good. An unwelcome intruder came in, sin, and brought death to us through our flesh and through the law. And now we're miserable because what we really want to do is walk with every person. Every person wants to walk with God in their inner man. Every person you meet, there is a part of him. God has enlightened him, and there's a desire in there for them to walk with God. Remember that when you're sharing with them. They may not indicate it. They may say totally contrary to it. They may say, no, I don't believe in God, but the truth is, deep in their heart, God is there in the image. But they have been held captive, and they've been sold into slavery, like us all. And then they're tormented because they say, I want to do what's right, but I keep doing the wrong. I want to do what's right. I keep doing the wrong. Who? This is so, I mean, I was so, as a young man, I was so miserable with that. At the age of 17, I tried, I tried to take my life. Because I was just so miserable being a Christian and doing the wrong things. And I couldn't figure it out. But here Paul says, who will deliver me from this? And he goes on to say, I will give thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through Jesus Christ. So Paul is not saying that he's still struggling like he did before. He's saying, now I've been set free. You and I have been set free. Jesus has delivered us from us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But is the struggle still there? Yeah, it's still there. The flesh is still there. The battle's still there. But we have a way out through Jesus Christ by renewing our minds. (laughs) <laughs> by walking in the Spirit. and now, The only way you can destroy the flesh is to walk in the Spirit. You can't fight it. You can't yell at it. You can't scream at it. You call it names all you want to. Call yourself stupid all you want to. It's not going to help. You start valuing your life that you are good, and an intruder came in, and Jesus came to destroy the intruder in all mankind. That's the ultimate goal. That's the plan. And now you and I can walk on that, and we can walk in that by renewing our minds daily. And walk perfectly, because inside we walk perfectly in unity with God. We just naturally know what he's doing. We naturally know what he wants. We naturally know the plan. Hallelujah. As we keep our minds renewed, as we keep ourselves, value ourselves, and value our neighbor, and love, and and realize who we really are, and separate this thing out. So when we do mess up, we go, wait a minute. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. That was the unwelcome intruder that just met, took over my body and did that horrible thing that I just did. Well, if you get to understanding this, it's night and day, light and darkness. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me, please? Would we rise up in this new inner man that's inside of us? You know, if you want to get in a head game with all this, you're going to be miserable. You try to figure all this out, and every, you're going to be miserable. And that's what Paul said. Who will deliver me from this body of death, this agonizing thing that goes on in my mind? I don't want to be doubtful. I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, scared. I don't want to be fearful. But it keeps coming up. And, but if you can say, wait a minute, I have an unwelcome intruder. Personify it. See that that death factor of sin 
personified and, and stepping into your life and just like somebody stepping in your house and starting to take over things and start messing it up and breaking dishes and all that. What would you do, man? And see, the confusion comes. If you think that's you doing all that destructive thing, then you, you are not going to value your life. You're going to be down on yourself. But if you see, no, it's an outside intruder came into my house that has no authority anymore. Jesus has delivered me from you and I resist you and you got to go. And you renew your mind to that. Hallelujah. You'll walk in the spirit. You and I will walk. I see it, man. I see in this walk in this, in the, uh, you call the supernatural, you call whatever you want to, but this is not some hyped up coaching dream here. This is reality. We're going for the wind. We are going for the wind and we're, we're winners. Father, I pray in the precious name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would help us today get, a, uh, this, get this image, hallelujah, this understanding so clear that we have this unwelcome intruder in our life called sin working through the flesh. But thanks be to you, God. You've got a way out for us, hallelujah. We acknowledge now that way is the fact that Jesus paid for that, destroyed that sin, had said, sentenced it, judged it, and said, you no longer have authority, you no longer have power in my children's lives. And now, Father, we just walk in that, renewing our minds, hearing the truth over and over and over until we believe it and it manifests. Hallelujah. And joy, joy flows in our life of joyfully working with the Holy Spirit, joyfully working with God, and joyfully seeing this whole earth differently, that our brothers and sisters are all out there, and they are longing for this freedom, and the Holy Spirit is working to get this truth to them, and we're working with the Holy Spirit to proclaim this incredibly good news, and multitudes of people are getting set free, multitudes of people are coming into the light, multitudes of people are coming into the strength and becoming who they really were supposed to be all along. The righteousness of God. The joyful children of God. The victorious in Jesus' name. And as we look into the, the unseen, when the unseen we're seeing the world that's going down the tubes, in the unseen we see the completion of God's plan, perfect plan to redeem mankind. It's harvest time. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we're in the field with joy reaping the harvest. Burn that image into us, Holy Spirit. Let the fire of God burn within us to see clearly what's really going on. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Whew, it's a lot to feed on. Feed on it. Take some time to look at those scriptures over. God bless you.